Welcome to Master Arts Theater's Quarantine Readers Theater. This is our attempt to use our creativity to do something that can benefit both our artists and our audience and patrons while we're all shuttered up safely in our homes during this unprecedented time. Now, you may have already seen some of our quarantine monologues online, where several of our talented actors prepared and recorded themselves doing a short monologue. But if you haven't, go and check out the Quarantine Monologues playlist on our YouTube channel. Now, this is going to be a little different. It's not just a monologue. We're actually presenting a full play. But there's no set, there's no elaborate costumes, just some talented actors reading a powerful script together from their homes. Now, if you've been involved in a show before, this is very much like a table read or a first read-through that happens at the very start of the rehearsal process. If you've never been in a show, think of this as your little glimpse behind the scenes. Now, our first selection is a shout out to all the fans of our last show, Father Brown. Today we are reading Magic, a Fantasy, a play written by none other than the creator of Father Brown, G.K. Chesterton. We pray that we would be able to tell the story that God would like us to tell, and that you would receive the story that he wants you to receive. Enjoy our reading of Magic, a Fantasy by G.K. Chesterton. Scene. A plantation of thin young trees in a misty and rainy twilight, some woodland blossom showing the patches on the earth between the stems. The stranger is discovered, a cloaked figure with a pointed hood, his costume might belong to modern or any other time, and the canonical hood is so drawn over the head that little can be seen of the face. A distant voice, a woman's, is heard, half singing, half chanting unintelligible words. The cloaked figure raises its head and listens with interest. The song draws nearer, and Patricia Carleon enters. She is dark and slight and has a dreamy expression. Though she is artistically dressed, her hair is a little wild. She has a broken branch of some flowering tree in her hand. She does not notice the stranger, and though he has watched her with interests, makes no sign. Suddenly, she perceives him and starts back. Oh, oh, who are you? Who am I? Well, I have a hat, but not to wear. I wear a sword, but not to slay. And ever in my bag, I bear a pack of cards, but not to play. What are you? What are you saying? Oh, it is the language of the fairies, my dear, O oh, daughter of Eve. I never thought fairies were like you. Are you taller than I am? We are of such stature as we will. But the elves grow small, not large, when they would mix with mortals. You mean they are beings greater than we are? Daughter of men, if you would see a fairy as he truly is, Look for his head above all the stars and his feet amid the floors of the sea. Old women have taught that the fairies are too small to be seen, but I tell you that the fairies are too mighty to be seen, for they are the elder gods before whom the giants were like pygmies. They are the elemental spirits, and any one of them is larger than the world. And you look for them in acorns and on toadstools and wonder that you never see them. But you... You come in the shape and size of a man. Because I would speak with a woman. I think you are growing taller as you speak. The scene appears to fade away and give place to the milieu of Act One, the Duke's drawing room, an apartment with an open French windows or any opening large enough to show a garden and one house fairly near. It is evening, and there is a red lamp lighted in the house beyond. The Reverend Cyril Smith is sitting with his hat and umbrella beside him, evidently a visitor. He is a young man with the highest of high church dog collars and the qualities of a restrained fanatic. He is one of the Christian socialist sort and takes his priesthood seriously. He is an honest man and not an ass. To him enters Mr. Hastings with papers in his hand. Oh, good evening. You are Mr. Smith. I mean, you are the rector, I think. 
I am the rector. I am the Duke's secretary. His grace asks me to say that he hopes to see you very soon, but he is engaged just now with the doctor. Is the doctor with him now? Why, strictly speaking, he is not. The doctor has gone over the road to fetch a paper connected with his proposal, but he hasn't far to go, as you can see. That's his red lamp at the end of the grounds. Yes, I know. I am much obliged to you. I will wait as long as is necessary. Oh, it won't be very long. Hasting exits. Enter by the garden doors Dr. Grimthorpe, reading an open paper. He is an old-fashioned practitioner, very much a gentleman, and very carefully dressed in, slightly anti in a slightly antiquated style. He is about 60 years old and might have been a friend of Huxley's. I beg your pardon, sir. I did not notice there was anyone here. I beg yours. A new clergyman cannot expect to be expected. I only came to see the Duke about some local affairs. And so, oddly enough, did I. But I suppose we should both like to get a hold of him by a separate ear. Oh, there's no disguise as far as I'm concerned. I've joined this league for starting a model public house in the parish, and in plain words, I've come to ask his grace for a subscription to it. And as it seems, I have joined in the petition against the erection of a model public house in this parish. The similarity of our position grows with every instant. Yes, I, I think we must have been twins. Well, what is a model public house? Do you mean a toy? I mean a place where Englishmen can get decent drink and drink it decently. Do you call that a toy? No. I should call that a conjuring trick, or, in apology to your cloth, I will say a miracle. I accept the apology to my cloth. I am doing my duty as a priest. How can the church have a right to make men fast if she does not allow them to feast? And when you have done feasting them, you will send them to me to be cured. Yes, and when you've done curing them, you'll send them to me to be buried. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have all the old doctrines. It is only fair that you should have all the old jokes now. <laughs> By the way, you call it a conjuring trick that poor people should drink moderately. I call it a chemical discovery that alcohol is not a food. You don't drink wine yourself? Drink wine? Well, what else is there to drink? So drinking decently is a conjuring trick that you can do anyhow? Well, well, let us hope so. Talking about conjuring tricks, there is to be conjuring and all kinds of things here this afternoon. Conjuring? Indeed! Why is that? Enter Hastings with a letter in each hand. His grace will be with you presently. He asked me to deal with the business matter first of all. He gives a note to each of them. But this is rather splendid. The Duke's given 50 pounds to the new public house. The Duke is very liberal. Very. But this is rather curious. He has also given 50 pounds to the League for opposing the new public house. The Duke is very liberal-minded. Hastings exits. Liberal-minded. Absent-minded, I should call it. Well, yes. The Duke does suffer a little from absence of mind. He is all for compromise. Don't you know the kind of man who, when you talk to him about the five best breeds of dog, always ends up buying a mongrel? The Duke is the kindest of men and always trying to please everybody. He generally finishes by pleasing nobody. Yes, I think I know the sort of thing. Take this conjuring, for instance. You know the Duke has two wards who are to live with him now. Yes, I heard something about a nephew and niece from Ireland. The niece 
came from Ireland some months ago, but the nephew comes back from America tonight. I think I will tell you all about it. In spite of your precious public house, you seem to be a sane man. And I fancy I shall not want, I shall want all the sane men that I can get tonight. I am at your service. Do you know I rather guess that you did not come here only to protest against my precious public house? Well, you guessed right. I was family physician to the Duke's brother in Ireland. I knew the family pretty well. I suppose you mean you knew something, something odd about the family. Well, they saw fairies and things of that sort. And I suppose to the medical mind, seeing fairies means such the same as seeing snakes. Well, they saw them in Ireland. I suppose it's quite correct to see fairies in Ireland. It's like gambling at Monte Carlo. It's quite respectable. But I do draw the line that they're seeing fairies in England. I do object to their bringing their ghosts and goblins and witches into the poor Duke's own back garden and within a yard of my own red lamp. It shows a lack of tact. But I do understand that the Duke's nephew and niece see witches and fairies between here and your lamp. Well, the nephew has been in America. It stands to reason that you can't see fairies in America. But there is this sort of superstition in the family, and not easy in my mind about the girl. Why, <laughs> what does she do? Oh, she wanders about the park and the woods in the evenings damp evenings for choice. She calls it the Celt Celtic twilight. I have no use for the Celtic twilight, my Celtic twilight myself. It has a tendency to get on the chest. But what is worse, she's always talking about meeting somebody, some elf or wizard or something. I don't like it at all. And have you told the Duke? Oh, yes. I told the Duke. The result was the Conjurer. The Conjurer? The Duke is indescribable. He will be here presently, and you shall judge for yourself, but two or three facts or ideas before him. The thing he makes out of them is always something that seems to have nothing to do with it. Tell any other human being about a girl dreaming of the fairies and her practical brother from America, and he would settle in some obvious way and satisfy someone Send her to America, or let her have her fairies in Ireland. Now, the Duke thinks a conjurer would just meet the case. I suppose he vaguely thinks it would brighten things up and somehow satisfy the believers. The believers' interest in supernatural things and the unbelievers' interest in smart things. As a matter of fact, the unbeliever thinks the conjurer's a fraud, and the believer thinks he is a fraud, too. The conjurer satisfies nobody, and that is why he satisfies the duke. Enter the duke with Hastings, carrying papers. The duke is a healthy, hearty man in tweeds, with a rather wandering eye. In the present state of peerage, it is necessary to explain that the duke, though an ass, is a gentleman. Good morning, Mr. Smith. So sorry to have kept you waiting, but we're rather in a rush today. But you know Mr. Collion is coming this afternoon? Yes, Your Grace. His train will be in by now. I have sent the trap. Well, thank you! Well, my nephew, Dr. Grimthorpe Morris, you know, Miss Collion's brother from America. I hear he's been doing great things out there. Petrol or something. Must move with the times, eh? I'm afraid Mr. Smith doesn't always agree with moving with the times. Oh, calm, calm. Progress, you know. Progress. Of course, I know how busy you are. You mustn't overwork yourself, you know. Hastings was telling me you laughed over those subscriptions of mine. Well, well, I believe in looking at both sides of a question, you know. Aspects, as old Buffle called them. Aspects. You represent the tendency to drink in moderation, and you do good in your way. The doctor represents the tendency not to drink at all. And he does good in his way. We can't be ancient Britons, you know. Ancient 
Britons? Don't bother. It's only his broad-mindedness. Oh, I saw the place you're putting up for it, Mr. Smith. Very good work, very good work indeed. Art for the people, eh? I particularly like that woodwork over the west door. I'm glad to see you're using the new sort of green. Why, it all reminds me one of the French Revolution. Does it remind you of the French Revolution? As much as anything else, his grace never reminds me of anything. Mr. Hastings goes out into the garden. He returns with Morris Carleon, a very young man, hardly more than a boy, but with very grown-up American dress and manners. He is dark, smallish, and active, and the racial type under his Americanism is Irish. See here, does a duke live here? Uh, yes, only one. I reckon he's the one I want, anyhow. I'm his nephew. Oh, delighted to see you, my dear boy. I hear you've been doing very well for yourself. <laughs> well, pretty well, Duke. And better still for Paul T. Van Damme, I guess. I manage the old man's minds out in Arizona, you know. Ah, very go-ahead, man. Very go-ahead methods, I'm told. Well, I dare say he does a great deal of good with his money. And we can't go back to the Spanish Inquisition. And how's Patricia? Oh, she's very well, I think. She... Well, then, where's Patricia? Uh, Miss Carleon is walking about the grounds, I think. It's a mighty chilly night to choose. Does my sister commonly suggest such evenings to take the air and the damp? If I may say so, I quite agree with you. I have often taken, I have often taken the liberty of warning your sister against going out in all weathers like this. The artistic temperament, what I always call the artistic temperament. Wordsworth, you know, and all that. All what? Why, everything's temperament, you know. It's her temperament to see the fairies. It's my temperament not to see the fairies. Why, I've walked all round the grounds 20 times and never saw a fairy. Well, it's like that about this wizard or whatever she calls it. For her, there's somebody there. For us, there would not be somebody there, don't you see? Somebody there? What do you mean? Well, you can't quite call it a man. A man? Well, as old Buffalo used to say, what is a man? With your permission, Duke, I eliminate old Buffalo. Do you mean that anybody has the tarnation cultus to suggest that some man... Oh, not a man, you know. Um, a magician. Something mythical, you know. Not a man, but a medicine man. I am a medicine man. And you don't look mythical, Doc. Well, you know, the artistic temperament. See here, Duke. In most commercial ways, we're a pretty forward country. In these moral ways, we're more content to be a pretty backward country. And if you ask me whether I like my sister walking about in the woods on a night like this, well, I don't. Oh, well, I'm afraid you Americans aren't so advanced as I'd hoped. Why, as old Bubble used to say... As he speaks, a distant voice is heard singing in the garden. It comes nearer and nearer. Whose voice is that? It is no business of mine to decide. You need not a trouble. I know who it is. Enter Patricia Carleon. Patricia, where have you been? Oh, oh, in Fairyland. And whereabouts is that? It's rather different from other places. It's either nowhere or, or it's wherever you are. Has it any inhabitants? Generally only two, one self and one shadow, but whether he is my shadow or I am his shadow, I never find out. <laughs> he? He who? Oh, you need to get conventional about it, Morris. He's not immortal. What's his name? I have no names there. You never really know anybody if you know his name. What does he look like? I've only met him in the twilight. He seems robed in a long cloak with... 
a peaked cap or hood like the elves in my nursery stories. Sometimes when I look out of the window here, I see him passing round this house like a shadow and see his pointed hood dark against the sunset or, or the rising of the moon. What does he talk about? Oh, he tells me the truth. Very many true things. He is a wizard. How do you know he's a wizard? I suppose he plays some tricks on you. I should know he was a wizard if he played no tricks. But once, he stooped and picked up a stone and cast it into the air, and it flew up into God's heaven like a bird. Was that what made you think he was a wizard? Oh, no. When I first saw him, he was tracing circles and pentagrams in the grass and talking the language of the elves. Do you know the language of the elves? Not until I heard it. See here, Patricia. I reckon this kind of thing is going to be the limit. I'm not going to have you I'm not going to have you let in by some blamed tramp fortune teller because you choose to lead, to read minor poetry about fairies. If this gypsy or whatever he is troubles you again. Come, you must allow a little more for poetry. We can't all feed on nothing but petrol. Quite right, quite right. Oh, and there uh, being Irish, don't you know? Celtic, as old Buffalo used to say. Charming songs, you know, about the Irish girl who has a plaid shawl and a banshee. Ah, poor old Gladstone. I thought you yourself considered the family superstition bad for the health. I consider a family stupor superstition is better for the health than a family quarrel. Well, it must be nice to be young and still see all of those stars and sunsets. We old buffers won't be too strict with you if your view of things sometimes gets a bit mixed up, shall we say? If the stars get loose about the grass by mistake, or if once or twice the sunset gets into the, into the east, we should only say, dream as much as you like. Dream for all mankind. Dream for us who can dream no longer but do not quite forget the difference. What difference? The difference between the things that are beautiful and the things that are there. That red lamp over my door isn't beautiful, but it is there. You might even come to be glad it is there when your stars of gold and silver have faded. I'm an old man now, but some men are still glad to find my red star. I do not say that they are the wise men. Yes, I know you are good to everybody, but don't you think there may be floating and spiritual stars which will last longer than the red lamps? Yes, but they are fixed stars. The red lamp will last my time. Oh, capital, capital. Why, it's like Tennyson. I remember when I was an undergrad. The red light disappears. No one sees it at first except Patricia, who points excitedly. What's the matter? The red star is gone! Nonsense! It's only someone standing in front of it. Say, Duke, there's someone standing in the garden. I told you he walked about the garden. If it's that fortune teller of yours... Somebody in the garden? Really? This land campaign? Morris reappears, rather breathless. My fellow, your friend, he slipped right through my hand like a shadow. I told you he was a shadow. Well, I guess there's going to be a shadow hunt then. Got a lantern, Duke? Oh, you need not trouble. He will come if I call him. She goes out into the garden and calls out some half-chanted and unintelligible words, somewhat like the song preceding her entrance. The red light reappears, and there is a slight sound as of fallen leaves shuffled by approaching feet. The cloaked stranger with the pointed hood is seen standing outside the garden doors. You may enter all doors. The figure comes into the room. Now see here, Wizen. We've got you, and we know you are fraught. Pardon me, I, I do not... Fancy that we know that, for myself, I must confess to something of the doctor's agnosticism. I didn't know you parsons stuck up for any fables but your own. 
I stick up for the thing every man has a right to, perhaps the only thing that every man has a right to. And what is that? The benefit of the doubt. Even your master, the petroleum millionaire, has a right to that. And I think he needs it more. I don't think there's much doubt about the question, Minister. I've been met, I've met this sort of fellow often enough. The sort of fellow who wheedles money out of girls by telling them he can make stones disappear. Do you say that you can make stones disappear? Yes, I can make stones disappear. I reckon you're the, the kind tough who, who knows how to make a watch and chain disappear. Yes, I know how to make a watch and chain disappear. And I should think you were pretty good at disappearing yourself. I have done such a thing. Will you disappear now? No. No, I think I'll appear instead. He throws back his hood, showing the head of an intellectual-looking man, young but rather worn. Then he unfastens his cloak and throws it off, emerging in complete modern evening dress. He advances down the room towards the Duke, taking out his watch as he does so. Good evening, Your Grace. I'm afraid I'm rather too early for the performance, but this gentleman seemed rather impatient for it to begin. Oh, uh, uh, good evening. Why, I'm really, uh, are you the... Yes, I am the conjurer. I am very sorry I'm not a wizard. I wish you were a thief instead. Have I committed a worse crime than thieving? You have committed the cruelest crime, I think, that there is. And what is the cruelest crime? Stealing a child's toy. What have I stolen? Fairy tale. Curtain. Act two. The same room, lighted more brilliantly an hour later in the evening. On one side, a table covered with packs of cards, pyramids, etc., at which the conjurer, in evening dress, is standing quietly setting out his tricks. A little more in the foreground, the Duke and Hastings with a number of papers. There are only a few small matters. Here are the programs of the entertainment your grace wanted. Uh, Mr. Carleon wishes to see them very much. Thanks, thanks. Shall I carry them for your grace? Oh, no, no, I shan't forget, I shan't forget. Why, you've no idea how businesslike I am. We have to be, you know. Oh, I know you're a bit of a socialist. But I assure you, there's a good deal to do, stake in the country and all that. Look at remembering faces now. The king never forgets faces. I never forget faces. Why the professor here who performs before the king? You see it on the caravans, you know. Performs before the king almost every night, I suppose. I sometimes let his majesty have an evening off and turn my attention, of course, to the very highest nobility. But naturally, I have performed before every sovereign pontate, white and black. There never was a conjurer who hadn't. That's right, that's right. And you'll say with me that the great business for a king is remembering people. I should say it was remembering people, well, remembering which people to remember. Oh, well, 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 now, being really businesslike, Shall I take the programs for your grace? Oh, no, 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 I shan't forget. Is there anything else? I have to go down to the village about the wire to Stratford. The only other thing at all urgent is the militant vegetarians. Ah, the militant vegetarians. You've heard of them, I'm sure. Won't obey the law so long as the government serves out meat. Well, let them be comforted. There are a good many people who don't get much meat. Well, 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 I'm bound to say they're very enthusiastic. Advanced, too. Oh, certainly advanced. Like Joan of Arc. Was Joan of Arc a vegetarian? Oh, well, well, it's a very high ideal, after all. The sacredness of life, you know. The sacredness of life. But they carry it too far. They killed a policeman down in Kent. Killed a policeman? Well, how vegetarian? Oh, well, I suppose it was, so long as they didn't eat him. 
They are asking only for small subscriptions. Indeed, they prefer to collect a large number of half crowns to prove the popularity of their movement. But I should advise... I'll give them three shillings then. If I might suggest... Hang it all. We gave the anti-vegetarians three shillings. It seems only fair. If I might suggest anything, I think your grace will be wise not to subscribe in this case. The anti-vegetarians have already used their funds to form gangs ostensibly to protect their own meetings. And if the vegetarians use theirs to break up the meetings, well, it will look rather funny that we have paid roughs on both sides. It will be rather difficult to explain when it comes before the magistrate. But I shall be the magistrate. Well, that's the system, my dear Hastings. That's the advantage of this system. Not a logical system, no Rousseau in it, but see how well it works. I shall be the very best magistrate that could be on the bench. The others would be biased, you know. Old Sir Lawrence is a vegetarian himself and might be hard on the anti-vegetarian roughs. Colonel Crashaw would be sure to be hard on the vegetarian roughs. But if I've paid both of them, of course, I shan't be hard on either of them. And there you have it. Just perfect impartiality. Shall I take the programs, Your Grace? No, no, I won't forget them. Well, Professor, what's the news in the conjuring world? No, I fear there never is any news in the conjuring world. Hmm. Don't you have a newspaper or something? Everybody has a newspaper now, you know. The, uh, Daily Sword Swallower. Or that sort of thing. No. I've been a journalist myself, but I think that journalism and conjuring will always be incompatible. Incompatible? Yes. Oh, but that's where I differ. That's where I take larger views. Larger laws, as old Buffle said. Nothing's incompatible, you know, except husband and wife and so on. Oh, you must talk to Morris about that. It's wonderful the way incompatibility has gone forward in the States. I only mean that the two trades rest on opposite principles. The whole point of being a conjurer is that you explain something that has happened. Well, and the journalist? Well, the whole point of being a journalist is that you explain a thing that didn't happen. But you'll want somewhere to discuss the new tricks. There are no new tricks. And if there were, we shouldn't want them discussed. Mm. I'm afraid you're not really advanced. Aren't you interested in modern progress? Yes. We're interested in all tricks done by illusion. Well, well, I must go and see how Morris is. Pleasure of seeing you later. The Duke exits, leaving the programs. Why a nice man, such asses. That seems all right. A pack of cards is a pack of cards. And the pack of cards that isn't a pack of cards. The hat that looks like a gentleman's hat, but which in reality, no gentleman's hat, only my hat. And I'm not a gentleman, I'm only a conjurer. And this is only a conjurer's hat. I could not take off this hat to a lady. If I could take rabbits out of it, goldfish out of it, snakes out of it, only I mustn't take my own head out of it, I suppose. I'm a lower animal than a rabbit or a snake. Anyhow, I can get out of the conjurer's hat, and I can't. I'm a conjurer, and nothing else but a conjurer. Unless I thought I was something else. And that would be worse. He begins to dash the cards rather irregularly about the table. Patricia enters. I beg your pardon. I came to get some programs. My uncle wants them. Miss Callion, might I speak to you a moment? Uh, the question is purely practical. I can hardly imagine what the question might be. Well, I, I am the question. And what have I to do with that? Well, you have everything to do with it. I'm the question, and you are... Well? What am I? I... Well, you are the answer. The answer to what? 
The answer to me, you think I'm a liar. I, I walked about the fields with you and I said I could make stones disappear. Well, so I can. I'm a conjurer in mere point of fact. It wasn't a lie. But if it had been a lie, I, I should have told it just the same. I would have told 20 such lies. And you, you may or may not know why. I know nothing about such lies. I, I don't know whether you have any notion of what it means to be a man like me. To talk to a lady like you, even on false pretenses. I'm an adventurer. I'm a blackguard, if one can earn the title by being in all the blackguard societies of the world. I've thought everything out by myself. When I was a gutter snipe in Fleet Street, although I was still a journalist in Fleet Street. Before I met you, I never guessed that rich people ever thought at all. Well, that is all I have to say. I mean, we had some good conversations, didn't we? I'm a liar, but I, I told you a great deal of truth. Yes. Yes, you did tell me a great deal of the truth. You told me hundreds and thousands of truth, but you never told me the truth that one wants to know. What is that? You never told me the truth about yourself. You never told me you were only the conjurer. I did not tell you because I do not even know it. I do not know whether I'm only the conjurer. What do you mean? Sometimes I'm afraid I'm something worse than the conjurer. I cannot think of anything worse than a conjurer who does not call himself a conjurer. There is something worse. But that's not what I want to say. Do you really find that very unpardonable? Come, let me put a case. Never mind about whether it is our case. A man spends his time incessantly in, in going about in third-class carriages to fifth-rate lodgings. is to make up new tricks, new pattern, new nonsense, sometimes every night of his life. Mostly, he has to do it in the beastly black cities of the Midlands and the North, where he can't get out into the country. Now and again, he, he does it at a gentleman's country house, where he can get out into the country. Well, you know that actors and orators and all sorts of people like to rehearse their effects in the open, if they can. You know, you know that story of the great statesman who was heard by his own gardener saying, as he paced the gardens, had I, Mr. Speaker, received the smallest intimation that I could be called upon to speak this evening? Well, conjurers are just the same. It takes time to prepare an impromptu. A man like that walks about the woods and fields doing all his tricks beforehand, talking all sorts of gibberish because he thinks he's alone. One evening, this man found he was not alone. He found a very beautiful child was watching him. Child? Oh, yes, that was his first impression. He is an intimate friend of mine. I've known him all my life. He tells me he has since discovered she is not a child. She does not fulfill the definition. What is the definition of a child? Somebody you can play with. Why do you wear that cloak with the hood up? I think it escaped your notice that it was raining. What did this friend of yours do? You've already told me what he did. He destroyed a fairy tale. For he created a fairy tale that he was bound to destroy. But do you blame a man very much, Miss Carleon, if, if he enjoyed the only fairy tale he had in his life? Suppose he said that the silly circles he was drawing for practice were really magic circles. Suppose he said the Bosch he was talking was, was the language of the elves. Remember, he's read fairy tales as much as you have. Fairy tales are the only democratic institutions. All the classes have heard all the fairy tales. Do you blame him very much if he tried to, to tried to have a holiday in a fairy land? I, I blame him less than I did. They still say there can be nothing worse than false magic. After all, it was he who brought the false magic. Yes, it was she who brought the real magic. Morris enters, evening dress. He walks straight up to the conjuring table and picks up one article after another, putting each one down with a comment. 
I know that one. I know that. I know that. Let's see. That's a false bottom, I think. Uh, that works with a wire. I know that. It, it goes up the sleeve. That's a false bottom again. And oh, that's, a, that's a substitute part, uh, pack of cards. That's... Really, Morris, you mustn't talk as if you knew everything. Oh, I don't mind him, anyone knowing everything, Miss Carleon. There's something that's much more important than knowing how a thing is done. And what is that? Knowing how to do it. Is that so, eh? Being the high-toned conjurer, because you can't any longer take all the sidewalk as a fairy. <laughs> really, Morris, you were very rude. And it's quite ridiculous to be rude. This gentleman was only practicing some tricks by himself in the garden. If there was any mistake, it was mine. Come, shake hands or do whatever men do when they apologize. Don't be silly, he won't turn you into a bowl of goldfish. Well, I guess that is so. Check. And you wouldn't turn me into a bowl of goldfish anyhow, Professor. I understand that when you do pro uh, produce a bowl of goldfish, that generally slips of carrots. Is that not so, Professor? Yes. Judge for yourself. <laughs> Very good. Very good. But I know that's I, I know how that's done. I know how that's done. You have an Indian rubber cap, you know, or or, or cover. Yes. Ah, most mysteries are a tolerable pain if you know the apparatus. I guess I wish we all had the old apparatuses of the old priests and prophets since the beginning of the world. I guess most of the old miracles and that were a matter of just a panel and wires. I don't, I don't quite understand you. What old apparatus do you want so much? Well, you see, sir. I just want that old apparatus that turned rods into snakes. I want those old apparatuses, sir, uh, that brought water out of a rock when old man Moses chose to hit it. I guess it's a pity we've lost the machinery. I would like to have those old conjurers here that called themselves patriarchs and prophets in your precious Bible. Morris, you mustn't talk like that. Well, I don't believe in religion. Hush, hush. Nobody but women believe in religion. I think this is a fitting opportunity to show you another ancient conjuring trick. Which one is that? The vanishing lady. Patricia exits. There is one part of their old apparatus I regret especially being lost. Yes? The apparatus for writing the Book of Job. Well, well, they didn't know everything in those old times. No, and in those old times, they knew they didn't. Where shall wisdom be found? And what is the place of understanding? Uh, it's somewhere in America, I believe. Man knoweth not the price thereof, neither is it found in the land of the living. The deep saith, it is not in me. The sea saith, it is not with me. Death and destruction say, we have heard tell of it. God understandeth the way thereof, and he knoweth the place thereof. For he looketh to the ends of the earth, and seeth under the whole heaven. But to man he hath said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. How's that for agnosticism, Dr. Grimthorpe? What a pity that apparatus is lost. Well, you may just smile how you choose, I reckon. But I say the conjurer here could be the biggest man in the biggest blessed centuries if he could just show us how the holy old tricks were done. We must say for this old man Moses that he was in an advance of his time. When he did the old tricks, they were new tricks. He got the pull on the public. He could do his tricks before grown men, great bearded fighting men who could win battles and sing songs. 
But this modern conjuring is all behind the times. That's why they only do it to schoolboys. This isn't a trick on that table. That, there isn't a trick on that table that I don't know. The whole trade's as dead as mutton, and not half so satisfying. Why, he brought out a bowl of goldfish just now. An old trick that anyone could do. Oh, I quite agree. The apparatus is perfectly simple. By the way, let me have a look at those goldfish of yours, will you? I'm not a paid play actor come here to conjure. I'm not here to do stale tricks. I'm here to see through them. And I say, it's an old trick, and... True, but as you said, we never show it, except to schoolboys. And may I ask you, Professor Hocus Pocus, or whatever your name is, whom are you calling a schoolboy? Oh, I beg your pardon. Your sister will tell you I'm sometimes mistaken about children. I forbid you to appeal to my sister. Oh, that is exactly what a schoolboy would do. I am not a schoolboy, Professor. I am a quiet businessman. But I tell you, in the country I come from, the hand of a quiet businessman goes to his hip pocket at an insult like that. Well, let it go to his hip pocket. I thought the hand of a quiet businessman more often went to someone else's pocket. You? Gentlemen, I think you are both forgetting yourselves. Perhaps. I ask pardon for what I said. It was certainly in excess of the young gentleman's desserts. I sometimes rather wish I could forget myself. Well, the entertainment's coming on, and you English don't like a scene. I reckon I'll have to bury the old blamed hatchet, too. Mr. Corleone, you will forgive an old man who knew your father well if he doubts whether you are doing yourself justice in treating yourself as an American Indian merely because you lived in America. In my old friend Huxley's time, we of the middle classes disbelieved in reason and all sorts of things, but we did believe in good manners. It is a pity if the aristocracy can't. I don't like to hear you say that you're a savage and have buried a tomahawk. I would rather hear you say, as your Irish ancestors would have said, that you have sheathed your sword with dignity proper to a gentleman. Very well. I've sheathed my sword with the dignity of a proper gentleman. And I have sheathed my sword with the dignity proper to a conjurer. How does a conjurer sheath a sword? Swallows it. Then we all agree, and there will be no quarrel. <laughs> May I have a word? I have a great dislike for, of a quarrel for a reason quite beyond my duty to the cloth. And what is that? I object to a quarrel because it always interrupts an argument. May I back you? May I bring you back for a moment to the argument? You were saying that these modern conjuring tricks are simply the old miracles when they have been found once. The old miracles when they have once been found out. But surely another view is possible. When we speak of things being sham, we generally mean that they are imitations of things that are genuine. Take that Reynolds over there of the Duke's great-grandfather. If I were to say it was a copy... Well, the Duke's real amiable, but I reckon you'll find what you call the interruption of an argument. Well, suppose I did say so. You wouldn't take it as meaning that Sir Joshua Reynolds never lived... Why should sham miracles prove to us that real saints and prophets never lived? There may be sham magic and real magic also. There may be turnip ghosts precisely because there are real ghosts. There may be theatrical fairies precisely because there are real fairies. You do not abolish the Bank of England by pointing to the forged bank note. I hope the professor enjoys being called a forged banknote. Almost as much as being called the prospectus of some American companies. Gentlemen, gentlemen. I'm sorry. Well, let's have the argument first. 
Then I guess we can have the quarrel afterwards. I'll clean this house of some encumbrances. See here, Mr. Smith, I am not putting anything on your <laughs> real miracle notion. I say, and science says, that there is a cause for everything. Science will find out that real cause, and sooner or later your old miracle will look mighty mean. Sooner or later, science will botanize a bit of your turnip ghosts and make your turnips that your make you look turnips yourselves for having taken any. I say I don't like this peaceful argument of yours. The boy is getting much too excited. You say old man Reynolds lived, and science don't say no. But I guess he's dead now. And you'll no more raise your saints and prophets from the dead than you'll make the Duke's great-grandfather to dance on that wall. The picture begins to sway slightly to and fro on the wall. Why, the picture is moving. You were in the room before us. Do you reckon that will take us in? You can do all of that with wires. Yes, I could do all that with wires. And you reckon I shouldn't know. <laughs> That, that's, that's how the darn dirty spiritualists do all their tricks. I, they say they can make the furniture move of itself. If it, does not, if it does move, they move it. And we mean to know how. A chair falls over with a slight crash. Morris almost staggers and momentarily fights for breath and words. You, why, that. Everyone knows that that a, a sliding plank it can be can be done with a sliding plank. It can be done with a sliding plank. You were right on the spot, Doc, when you talked about that red lamp of yours. That red lamp in the light of science will put out all the lanterns of your turnip ghosts. It's a consuming fire, Doctor, but it is the red light of morning. Your priests can no more stop that light from shining its color and its radiance than Joshua could stop the sun and moon. Why, a real fairy in an elfin cloak strayed near the lamp an hour or two ago, and it turned him into a common society clown with a white tie. The lamp at the end of the garden turns blue. They all look at it in silence. Wait a bit! Wait a bit! I've got it! I've got you! I'll, I'll have you! Oh, you put wire? No, that can't be. Well, well, just at this moment, we need not inquire. You call your man, yourself a man of science, and you dare to tell me not to inquire? We only mean that for the moment, you might let it alone. No, priest! I will not let it alone! Could it be done with mirrors? Um, um, you have a mirror. I've got it! I've got it! A mixture of lights! Why not? If you throw a green light on a red light... You don't get blue. If you have done this trick, for God's sake, undo it. The light turns red again. It's the, it's the glass. You've done something to the glass. I don't think you'll find anything wrong with the glass. Then I'll find out what's wrong with the lamp. Morris disappears into the garden. It is still a wet night, I'm afraid. Yes, and somebody else will be wandering about the garden now. Through the broken glass doors, Morris can be seen marching backwards and forwards with swifter and swifter steps. I suppose in this case, the Celtic twilight will not get on the chest. Oh, if it were only the chest. Patricia enters. Where is my brother? I'm afraid he's walking about in fairyland. But he mustn't go out on a night like this. It's very dangerous. Yes, it is very dangerous. He might meet a fairy. What do you mean? You went out in this sort of weather and you met this sort of fairy. So far it's only brought you sorrow. I'm going out to find my brother. She goes out into the garden through the open doors. What is that noise? She is not singing those songs to him, is she? No, uh, he does not understand the language of the elves. But what are all those cries and gasps I hear? The normal noises, I believe, of a quiet businessman. Sir, I can understand your being bitter. For I admit you have been 
uncivilly received. But to speak like that just now. Patricia reappears at the garden doors, very pale. May I speak to the doctor? My dear lady, certainly. Shall I fetch the duke? I would prefer the doctor. Can I be of any use? I only want the doctor. That was, the last was a wonderful trick of yours. Thank you. I suppose you mean it was the only one I did that you didn't see through. Something of the kind, I confess. Your last trick was the best trick I have ever seen. It is so good that I wish you had not done it. And so do I. How do you mean? Do you wish you had never been a conjurer? I wish I'd never been born. The conjurer exits. The doctor enters, very grave. It is all right so far. We have brought him back. You told me there was mental trouble with the girl. No, I told you there was mental trouble in the family. Where is Mr. Morris Carleon? I have got him into bed in the next room. His sister is looking after him. His sister? Oh, then, do you believe in fairies? Believe in fairies? What do you mean? At least you put the person who does believe in them in charge of the person who doesn't. Well, I suppose I do. You don't think she'll keep him awake all night with fairy tales? Certainly not. You don't think she'll throw the medicine bottle out of the window and administer uh, a dewdrop or anything of the sort or, or a four-leafed clover, say? No, of course not. I only ask because you scientific men are a little hard on us clergymen. You don't believe in a priesthood, but you'll admit I'm more really a priest than this conjurer is really a magician. You've been talking a lot about the Bible and the higher criticism, but even by the higher criticism, the, criticism, the, the Bible is older than the language of the elves, which was, as far as I can make out, invented this afternoon. But Miss Carleone believed in the wizard. Miss Carleone believed in the language of the elves, and you put her in charge of, the, of an invalid without a flicker of doubt because you trust women. Yes. I trust women. You trust a woman with the practical issues of life and death through sleepless hours when a shaking hand or an extra grain would kill. Yes. But if the woman gets up to go to early service at any church, you call her weak-minded and say that nobody but woman, women can believe in religion. I should never call this woman weak-minded. No. By God, not even if she went to church. Yet, there are many as strong-minded who believe passionately in going to church. Weren't there as many who believed passionately in Apollo? And what harm cause of believing in Apollo? And what a massive harm may have come of not believing in Apollo? Does it never strike you that doubt can be a madness as well as be faith that asking questions may be a disease as well as proclaiming doctrines you talk of religious mania is there no such thing as irreligious mania is there no such thing as the house at this moment then you think no one should question at all i think that is what comes of questioning. Why can't you leave the universe alone and let it mean what it likes? Why shouldn't the thunder of Jupiter? More men have made themselves silly by wondering what the devil it was if it wasn't Jupiter. Do you believe in your own religion? Suppose I don't. I should still be a fool to question it. The child who doubts about Santa Claus has insomnia. The child who believes has a good night's rest. You are a pragmatist. The Duke enters absentmindedly. That is what the lawyers call vulgar abuse. But I do appeal to practice. 
Here is a family over which you tell me a mental calamity hovers. Here is the boy who questions everything and a girl who can believe anything upon which has the curse fallen? Talking about the pragmatists. Oh, I'm glad to hear. Ah, yes, very forward movement. I suppose Roosevelt now. Well, you move, you know, we move. First, there was the missing link. No. First, there was protoplasm. And then there was the missing link, and Magna Carta, and so on. Why look at the Insurance Act? I would rather not. Ah, prejudice, prejudice. You doctors, you know. Well, I never had any myself. Any what? I never had any Marconis myself. Wouldn't touch them. Well, I must speak with Hastings. Duke exits aimlessly. Well, of all the... You asked me just now which member of the family had inherited the family madness. Yes, I did. On my living soul, I believe it must be the Duke. Our actors will be back to finish the reading in just a moment. We are living in very difficult times that are impacting all of us. But this is especially the case for small businesses and organizations like ours who depend upon performances and public events to supply our ministry with the needed income to continue. If you're enjoying this presentation or any of the other offerings that we've put out online during this time, or if you have a burden to see quality performing arts continue, would you prayerfully consider giving to Master Arts at this time? If you're able, your donation would be greatly appreciated and would help us to return strong after this difficult time. Gifts are not expected, but they're definitely appreciated. You can find links to our support and giving page in our description below. Thanks for your time and your support. Now, back to the show. Act three. Room partly darkened, a table with a lamp on it, and an empty chair. From room next door, faint and occasional sounds of the tossing or talking of the invalid. Enter Dr. Grimthorpe with a rather careworn air and a medicine bottle in his hand. He puts it on the table and sits down in the chair as if keeping a vigil. The conjurer enters, carrying his bag and cloak for departure. As he crosses the room, the doctor rises and calls after him. Forgive me, but may I detain you for one moment? I suppose you are aware that, that there have been rather grave developments in the case of illness, which happened after your performance. I would not say, of course, because of your performance. Thank you. Nevertheless, mental excitement is, necessary, is necessarily an element of importance in physiological troubles. And your triumphs this evening were really so extraordinary that I cannot pretend to dismiss them from my patient's case. He is at present in a state of somewhat analogous to delirium, but in which he can still partially ask and answer questions. The question he continually asks is how you managed to do your last trick. Oh, my last trick. Now, I was wondering whether we could make an arrangement which would be fair to you in this matter. Would it be possible for you to give me, in confidence, the means of satisfying this, this fixed idea he seems to have got? This special condition of semi-delirious disputation is a rare one and connected in my experience with rather unfortunate cases. You mean to say he's going mad? Really? You ask me an unfair question. I could not explain the fine shades of these things to a layman. And even if, if what you suggest were so, I should have to regard it as a professional secret. Oh. And don't you think you ask me a rather unfair question, Dr. Grimthorpe? If yours is a, prof if yours is a professional secret, 
Is not mine a professional secret too? If you may hide the truth from the world, why may not I? Don't tell your tricks, I don't tell my tricks. Ours are not tricks. <laughs> ah, no one can be sure of that until the tricks are told. But the public can see a doctor's cures as plain as... Yes, as plain as they saw the red lamp over this door this evening. Your secret, of course, would be strictly kept by everyone involved. Oh, of course. People in delirium always keep secrets strictly. No one sees the patient but his sister and myself. Yes. His sister, is she very anxious? What would you suppose? Doctor, there are about a thousand reasons why I should not tell you how I really did that trick, but one will suffice because it's the most practical of all. Well, and why shouldn't you tell me? Because you wouldn't believe me if I did. The Duke enters with papers in his hand. His usual gaiety of manner has a rather forced air, owing to the fact that by some vague sick room associations, he walks as if on tiptoe and begins to speak in a sort of louder, shrill whisper. This he fortunately forgets and falls into his more natural voice. So very kind of you to have waited, Professor. Well, I expect Dr. Grimthorpe has explained the little difficulty we are in much better than I could. Nothing like the medical mind for a scientific statement. Look at Ibsen. Of course, the professor feels considerably re considerable reluctance in the matter. He points out that his secrets are an essential part of his profession. Of course, of course, tricks of the trade, eh? Very proper, of course. Quite a case of noblesse oblige. But I dare say we shall be able to find a way out of the matter. Now, my dear sir, I hope you will not be offended if I say that this ought to be a business matter. We are asking you for a piece of your professional work and knowledge, and if I may have the pleasure of writing you a check. I thank your grace. I've already received my check from your secretary. You'll find it on the counterfoil just after the check you so kindly gave to the Society for the Suppression of Conjuring. Well, now I don't want you to take it that way. I want you to take it in a broader way. Free, you know. Modern and all that. Wonderful man, Bernard Shaw. If, if you feel any delicacy, the payment need not be made merely to you. I quite respect your feelings in the matter. Quite so, quite so. Haven't you got a, a cause or something? Everybody has a cause, you know. Conjurers, widows, or something of that kind. No, I have no widows. Well, then something like a, a pension or annuity for any widows you may procure. A cup. Let me call it a, a couple of thou. The conjurer takes the check and looks at it in a grave and doubtful <laughs> way. As he does so, the rector comes slowly into the room. You'd really be willing to pay a sum like this to know the way I did that trick? Well, I would willingly pay much, much more. I think I explained to you that the case is serious. You'd pay much more. <laughs> well, suppose I tell you the, trick, the, the secret and you find there's nothing in it. You mean that it's really quite simple? Why, well, I would say that that would be the best thing that could possibly happen. A little healthy laughter is the best possible thing for convalescence. I do not think you will laugh. But as you say, it is something quite simple. The simplest thing there is in the world. That's why you will not laugh. Why? What do you mean? What shall we do? You will disbelieve it. And why? Because it is so simple. You ask me how I really did that last trick. I will tell you how I did the last trick. I did it by magic. Do you really mean that you take the check and then tell us that it was only magic? I tear the check and I tell you it was only magic. But hang it all. There is no such thing. Yes, there is. I wish to God that I did not know there is such a thing. Why, really magic? Yes, Your Grace. One of those larger laws you were telling us about. One moment, sir. What do you want? I want to apologize to you 
I mean, on behalf of the company, I think it was wrong to offer you money. I think it was more wrong to mystify you with medical language and call the thing delirium. I have more respect for conjurer's patter than for doctor's patter. They are both meant to stupefy, but yours only to stupefy for a moment. Now, I put it to you in plain words and on plain human Christian grounds. Here is a poor boy who may be going mad. Suppose you had a son in such a position. Would you not expect people to tell you the whole truth if it could help you? Yes, and I have told you the whole truth. Go and find out if it helps you. You know quite well it will not help us. Why not? You know quite well why not. You are an honest man, and you have said it yourself, because he would not believe it. Well, does anybody believe it? Do you believe it? Your question is quite fair. Come, let us sit down and talk about it. Let me take your cloak. I will take off my cloak when you take off your coat. Why? Do you want me to fight? <laughs> I want you to be martyred. I want you to bear witness to your own creed. I say these things are supernatural. I say this was done by a spirit. The doctor does not believe me. He's an agnostic and he knows everything. The Duke does not believe me. He, can, he cannot believe anything so plain as a miracle. But what the devil are you for if you don't believe in a miracle? What does your coat mean if it doesn't mean that there is such a thing as the supernatural? What does your cursed collar mean if it doesn't mean that there is such a thing as a spirit? Why the devil do you dress up like that if you don't believe in it? Perhaps you don't believe in devils. I believe. I wish I could believe. Yes. I wish I could disbelieve. Patricia enters. May I speak to the conjurer? You want the doctor? No, the conjurer. Are there any developments? I only want to speak to the conjurer. They all withdraw, either at the garden or other doors. Patricia walks up to the conjurer. You must tell me how you did the trick. You will. I know you will. I know my poor brother was rude to you. He's rude to everybody, but he's such a little, little boy. I suppose you know there's things men never tell to women. They are too horrible. Yes, and there are things that women never tell to men. They also are too horrible. I am here to hear them all. Do you really mean I may say anything I like? However dark it is, however dreadful it is, however damnable it is. I have gone through too much to be terrified now. Tell me the very worst. I'll tell you the very worst. I fell in love with you when I first saw you. You told me I looked like a child and... I told a lie. This is terrible. Well, I, I was in love. I took an opportunity. You believed simply that I was a magician, but I... It is terrible. It is terrible. I never believed that you were a magician. You never believed I was a magician? I always knew you were a man. I am a man. And you are a woman. And all the elves have gone to Elfland and all the devils to hell. And you know what? You and I, we will walk out of this, this vulgar house, and we'll be married. Everyone is crazy in this house tonight, I think. Oh, what am I saying? As if you could marry me, oh my word. This is the first time that you have failed in courage. <laughs> what do you mean? I mean to draw your attention to the fact that you have recently made an offer. I accept it. No, 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 it's, it's nonsense, it's nonsense. How can a man marry an archangel, let alone a lady? 
My mother was a lady. She married a dying fiddler who tramped the roads. And the mixture placed the cat and banjo with my body and soul. I can see my mother now cooking food in dirtier and dirtier lodgings, darning socks with weaker and weaker eyes when she might have worn pearls by consenting to a rational person. And she might have grown pearls by consenting to be an oyster. There was little pleasure in her life. There is little, well, very little in everybody's. The question is what kind? We can't turn life into a pleasure, but, but we can choose such pleasures as are worthy of us in our immortal souls. Your mother chose, and I have chosen. Immortal souls. And I suppose if I knelt down to worship you, you and everyone else would laugh. I think this is a more comfortable way. Yes, I'll do everything your mother did. Not so well, of course. I'll darn that conjurer's hat. Does one darn hats? Oh, and cook the conjurer's dinner. By the way, what is a conjurer's dinner? There's always the goldfish, of course. Carrots. And of course, now I come to think of it, you can always take rabbits out of the hat. Why, what a cheap life it must be. How do you cook rabbits? He's always talking about poached rabbits. Really, we shall be as happy as is good for us. We'll have confidence in each other at least. No secrets. I insist on knowing all the tricks. <laughs> I don't know whether I'm on my head or on my heels. And now, as we're going to be so confidential and comfortable, you'll just tell me the real, practical, tricky little way you did that last trick. How did I do that trick? I did it by the devils. Well, you could believe in fairies. Can't you believe in devils? No, I can't believe in devils. Well, this room is full of them. What does it all mean? It only means that I've done what many have done, but few, I think, have thriven by. I told you I'd once mixed with many queer sets of people. Among others, I mixed with those who pretend, truly and falsely, to do our tricks by the aid of spirits. I dabbled in a little table wrapping and table turning, but I soon had a reason to give it up. Why, why did you give it up? It began by giving me headaches, and I found that every morning, after a spiritualist seance, I had a queer feeling of loneliness and degradation, of having been soiled. Much like the feeling I suppose that people have the morning after they've been drunk. But I happen to have what people call a strong head. I've never really been drunk. I am glad of that. It hasn't been for want of trying. But it wasn't long before the spirits with whom I'd been playing at table turnings did what I think they generally do, generally do at the end of all such table turning. What do they do? They turn the tables. They turn the tables upon me. I don't wonder at you believing in fairies. As long as these things were my servants, they seemed to me like fairies. When they tried to be my masters, how that they were not fairies, I, I found the spirits with whom I at least had come in contact with were evil. Awfully, unnaturally evil. Did they, did they say so? Well, don't talk about what they said. I was a loose fellow, but I'd not fallen so low as such things. I resisted them after a pretty bad time, psychologically speaking. I cut the connection. They're always tempting me to use the supernatural power I'd got from them. It was not very great, but it was, it was enough to move things about, to alter light and so on. I don't know whether you realize that it's rather a strain on a man to drink bad coffee at a coffee stall when he knows he has just enough magic in him to make a bottle of champagne walk out of an empty shop. I think you behaved very well. 
And when I fell at last, it was nothing half so clean and Christian as champagne. And black, long, dried and angered, and all kinds of heathenry because of the impudence of a schoolboy. I called on the fiends and they obeyed. Poor fellow. Goodness is the only goodness that never goes wrong. And what are we to do with Morris? I believe you now, my dear, but, but he will never believe. There is no bigot like an atheist. I must think. He walked towards the garden windows. The other men reappear to arrest his movement. Where are you going? I'm going to ask the God whose enemies I have served if I'm still worthy to save a child. The conjurer exits into the garden. He paces up and down, exactly as Morris has done. As he does so, Patricia slowly goes out, and a long silence follows, during which the remaining men stir and stamp very restlessly. The darkness increases. It is long before anyone speaks. Remarkable man, that conjurer. Clever man. Curious man. Very curious man. A kind of man, you know. Lord bless us, what's that? What's what? Hey? What's what? I swear I heard a footstep. Why, Hastings? Hastings! We thought you were a ghost. You must be a looking white or something. I have brought back the answer of the anti-vegetarians. I mean the vegetarians. Why, Hastings? You are looking white. I ask your grace's pardon. I had a slight shock on entering the room. A shock? What shock? It is the uh, first time I think that your grace's work has been disturbed by any private feelings of mine. I shall not trouble your grace with them. It, it will not occur again. Hastings exits. What an extraordinary lady. I wonder if... Hmm. How do you feel? I feel I must have a window shut, or I must have it open, and I don't know which it is. In God's name, go! Really, sir? I'm not used to be spoken to. It was not you whom I told to go. No, but I think I will go. This room is simply horrible. Room? Horrible? Room horrible. No, no, no. Only a little crowded. A little crowded. I don't seem to know all the people. We can't like everybody. These large at-homes. Go back to hell, from which I called you. It is the last order that I shall give. And what are you going to do? I'm going to tell that poor little lad a lie. I found in the garden what he did not find in the garden. I've managed to think of a natural explanation of that trick. I think you are something like a great man. Can I take your explanation to him now? No, thank you. I will take it myself. The conjurer exits into the other room. We all feel devilishly queer just now. Wonderful things there are in the world. Hmm. I suppose it's all electricity. I think there has been more than electricity in all of this. Patricia enters, still pale but radiant. Oh, Morris is ever so much better. The conjurer has told him a, such a good story of how the trick was done. The conjurer oh. enters. Professor, we owe you a thousand things. Really? You have doubled your claim to originality. It is much more marvelous to explain a miracle than to work a miracle. What was your explanation, by the way? I shall not tell you. Indeed. Why not? Because God and the demons and that immortal mystery that you deny has been in this room tonight. Because you know it has been here. Because you felt it here. Because you know the spirits as well as I do and fear them as much as I do. Well? Because all this would not avail. 
If I told you the lie I told Morris Carleon about how he did that trick. Well? You would believe it as he believed it. You cannot think how that trick could be done naturally. I alone have found out how it could be done after I'd done it by magic. But if I tell you the natural way of doing it... Well... Half an hour after I have left this house, you will all be saying how it was done. Goodbye. I shall not say goodbye. You were great, as well as good. But a saint can be a temptress as well as a sinner. I put my honor in your hands. Yes, I have a little left. It began with a fairy tale. Have I any right to take advantage of that fairy tale? Has not that fairy tale really and truly come to an end? Yes, that fairy tale has really and truly come to an end. It is very hard for a fairy tale to come to an end. If you leave it alone, it lingers everlastingly. Our fairy tale has come to an end in the only way a fairy tale can come to an end. The only way a fairy tale can leave off being a fairy tale. I don't understand you. It has come true. Thank you so much for watching Quarantine Readers Theater. We hope you enjoyed this presentation. If you'd like to give to support the Ministry of Master Arts Theatre, links to our giving page are in the description below. If you have suggestions for future readings, please feel free to leave a comment or send an email to director at masterarts.org. That's director at masterarts.org. Thanks so much for spending some time with us. We hope you enjoyed this reading.